Hey everybody, welcome back to the I Can Larry Show, episode number 17. Can you believe it? Hello, 17 folks. shows, and look who's next door to me. Who is that stranger? The guy with the big head. <laughs> the guy with the big head, that's Larry. And Larry uh, also oh, I'm talking about you. Oh. Also Larry, known as the published author and book writer extraordinaire. And book writer is a term of just a fantastic, fantastic piece of literature. I can't hide it. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. I've actually book. read so many stories I've read twice. That's how much I like them. And my favorite one is still getting burned Robert up in a Charles? trash barrel. <laughs> well, the so interesting thing about that was, and I think I mentioned it before, was people actually saw the fire. Mm-hmm. Of, of barbecue Charlie cooking up his victim. In, They're in just the, looking across the lake thinking, oh, somebody's got a bonfire. They're probably cooking. No, no. They thought it was a, 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 a witch's coven doing some sort of satanic ritual, and they didn't want to get involved. It actually says that in the newspaper article. <laughs> but they had no idea they were actually burning a human being. <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> uh, monster, not sponsored. In case you're wondering, I just got back from my run. It was a lovely 34 degrees this morning in New Mexico in May. Can you believe it? They say climate change ain't real. I don't think I've ever seen that kind of temperature in May here. You want to know what the high is going to be today in Vero Beach, Florida? I would imagine probably 90. 92. Yeah, see. I just got back from uh, California, San Diego, and uh, the high over there is like 75 on the beach. It just doesn't get hot in San Diego. Mm. It's amazing. You know, their temperatures like 80 degrees all year long, right around 80. Never, never any hotter, never any colder. It's a weird, strange. That's no, that's, I, I could deal with that. I could deal with that. I could it's weird. That. It's, it's a Pacific Ocean thing. It, uh, you know, mm -hmm. if you go inland 50 miles, you're, you're on your own. You're in Death Valley. <laughs> it's 100 degrees. Desert, yeah. Yeah. But if you stay like within 20 miles of the coast, all the way up to San Francisco, the median temperature all year long is between, 65 and 80. It's really Water crazy. not sponsored. Uh, is it florid? 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 Florinated? Yes. Florida water. Actually, it is uh, from the from Lake County. It's from, We have a ton of natural springs up in the northern uh, part of the of the state, and that's where all this Zephyr Hills water comes from. I know which one you've been sipping off of the Fountain of Youth. Yeah, Larry's actually 105 years old, but yeah, they I don't found the Fountain of Youth. 101. <laughs> <laughs> oh man quit stealing my punchlines <laughs> so anyway i just wanted to say something real quick about my vacation uh on the way back we stopped at a casino i'm not going to mention but it's a fairly new built casino it's probably been there for about six seven years it's in arizona and there you know arizona that part of arizona off i-40 is all desert it's flat and uh huge huge parking lot it's always empty there's like this casino sits out in the middle of nowhere and there's like only like 15 cars there all the time it's the, probably mostly employees and it, i find it kind of odd that even the truckers they have a huge area for truck drivers to park but yet they choose to park on the interstate on the off-ramp right there about a mile away instead of just going to this giant parking lot and i stayed there before and never had any issues but we pulled in about seven o'clock in the evening and as soon as i pulled in i just had a weird feeling about the place and i don't know why it should be really relaxing there's other motorhomes parked in there here, you know, scattered, maybe five of them here and there. It should be very relaxing and nice. But just pulling in there, I had a, a feeling of dread. Sounds stupid, I know, but I've stopped, you know, we, I, I stopped and I put the slide outs out and stuff and get more comfortable and shut everything off. And I keep feeling this buzzing, vibrating sound throughout the motor. And at first I'm thinking maybe a fan's running or water pump's running or something. I check everything. Nothing's turned on. But the whole, the whole motorhome is vibrating, and it turns out everything is vibrating in, in, in this area. I mean, it, 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 it's really? like a buzz. Yeah, it's like, a, it's like an infrasound. You can't really hear it, but you can feel it. And everything you touched in the motorhome, you touched a wall, you, you go outside, you could sense it in the air. And I'm like, what the hell is causing this? And uh, uh, later on, you know, about, probably about 9.30 or so, we were laying in bed watching a movie. And Debbie said, something just touched my leg. And she thought it was one of our dogs. And I'm like, no, both dogs are on me as usual. And uh, she goes, well, something just touched my leg. And I'm like, something strange going on here. For the rest of the night, I felt that buzz. I mean, even the morning when I got up, I felt that buzz. And just had a really weird, didn't sleep at all. I should have slept like a rock after driving 500 some odd miles. Had a nice dinner and watched a movie. I should have been tired and gone to sleep. 
I could not go to sleep. It buzzing kept me awake. I tossed and turned enough to at 3.30 in the morning. I said, I had enough of this shit. I said, we got to get, get rolling. I get the hell out of this parking lot. And uh, <laughs> so I brew myself a cup of coffee real quick. I sit down in my seat and promptly dump it in my lap. I'm scolding hot coffee. I'm like, this place is bullshit. <laughs> this shouldn't happen. You know, and it would get on the road and like 10 miles down the road, I have an engine malfunction on my motorhome, which was something I could fix within 10 minutes, but it shouldn't have happened. Uh, it was just, there was a bad feeling about that place. You know, the old sixth sense we keep talking about. Mm -hmm. Red alert, gauge was all the way to the right. There was just something wrong at that time. I've been no. there before and never had that feeling, but this time, you all night long, you had this feeling of dread, and there should have been no dread. It's, it's a peaceful, beautiful area. Yeah. You shouldn't have no feeling of dread, but there was something going on that night. Well, I find it interesting that you felt that vibration because we've talked before in past shows about frequency and vibration really being a center part of a lot of what, what's happening. And you just got to wonder if that vibration you were feeling was because something was off and you just needed to get the heck out of Dodge. And I would have liked to have known if other people were experiencing it that night. I mean, you'll never know, but it would have been interesting to find out if other people had been feeling that or was it just something? Did Debbie feel it? Could she feel no, vibration? No, no. There you she, go. She felt she felt being touched, but she didn't feel any vibration. And I was pissed. It was pissing me off. I'm like, touch the wall, touch the floor, touch. Don't you feel it? And she goes, no. And I'm like, I wish I'd have had some of my investigative equipment with me, you know, yeah, EMF yeah, gauge, yeah. that kind of stuff. But I didn't, didn't have any of that stuff with me. But I find it odd that people just subconsciously stay away from that place. It seems like all the truckers, because I forty is is a mecca of trucks, you know, coming out of LA, going to the rest of the world. And uh, there was literally probably 50 trucks parked on the off-ramp and on-ramp to that specific casino, which is in the middle of nowhere, once again, where they could just drive maybe less than a mile and have probably 30-acre parking lot that is literally empty, designed for trucks. <laughs> so there was like three trucks parked in there. The rest of them were all on the interstate. I'm like, it makes no sense. I don't get it. Might be worthwhile to do uh, some sort of background on the, on the, uh, the area of the land. I think it's Navajo land. So. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that you'd find out a whole lot of it's, you know, tribal land, but uh, it might be interesting to find out if anything significant had happened there in the past. I don't know. Something, something didn't feel right. I guarantee you that. I didn't and feel very Being tough. out in the middle of nowhere, strange things happen all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's kind of what leads up to our story of the day. And our story of the day is a disappearance that happened at Yosemite, or as some people call it Yosemite. I don't think that's correct, though. <laughs> that's people I can't read. But I was looking up some of the stats for Yosemite Camp uh, National Park. An ungodly number of people disappeared in that place. Uh, let me see. Let me, I have to pull up my phone real quick. Uh, and I've lost it. Oh, boy. Where'd I go? Yosemite, Yosemite does have the highest number of reported missing persons of any national park. About 40 people per year. Now, granted, 38 of them get found. And out of those 38, 15 of them have strange stories to tell. Like, I was walking along and suddenly I lost time. I was walking along and there was a shimmery thing in the trail up ahead of me. And I'm like, holy crap. I, I turned around and headed out the other way and realized it's you know half a day's gone by and I can't explain where it went. Some of these people reported seeing lights in the sky. Some of these people that stayed out overnight in this camp, uh, in this national park, have reports of cryptids, everything from Sasquatch throwing shit at them, tree rocks, trees breaking, weird sounds, weird howls. Um, a ton of people have disappeared and never been found out there. In current cases, I mean, the case we're going to talk about goes back to 1972, uh, I think. Let's we'll find out. Anyone. We'll find out when I get into the story. But there's some recent ones, even, and uh, some really, really strange ones. But I picked this one here because I guess we'll start at the bottom of the barrel and work our way to the top eventually. But for this, this story is pretty, pretty interesting in itself. I mean, you kind of read into it a little bit, right? You checked it out a little oh, bit. Oh yeah, yeah. So this story, stand by. I got a picture of the young lady that's missing. I'll slap it up there real quick so you kind of get an idea what we're talking about maybe maybe i got a picture 
I certainly should have a picture. I should be more prepared like Larry Lawson. He's always very well prepared for these things. Me, I'm never prepared. Uh, blame all Larry for that. So. Well, I certainly did have a picture of her somewhere. Well, she was, uh, if it helps, she was five foot five, 120 pounds, blonde, curly hair, mm -hmm. uh, had braces. Um, typical teenager in so many ways. Yeah, I don't know what I have my picture on. But I'll, I'll attach it to the video at the very end, some of the news articles and clippings. Yeah. I'll, still, I'll put them on the end of the video when I edit this thing. But as you said, she was a 14 year old young girl. And, uh, Let's see. Oh, I'll read some of the story and we'll stop and, and discuss some of this. So Stacy Aras, A-R-R-A-S, I'm guessing that's how you say it, was only 14 years old when she vanished without a trace inside Yosemite National Park in 1981. To this day, her disappearance remains unsolved. It's a long time. Though Yosemite National Park has been the site of other people going missing and creepy occurrences, Aras's case is especially eerie, giving the startling lack of evidence. And that's kind of what we're going to touch on as old cops and old uh, investigators. Uh, we're all kind of evidence-based all the time. And uh, there's not much to go on on this one. Due to the mysterious circumstances surrounding the event, some people believe there are supernatural forces at play. And while there's probably a scientific or rational explanation for what happened to Stacey Harris on July 17, 1981, the reality of her departure remains as haunting as, a paranormal, as any paranormal mystery. You could kind of chalk it up a little bit as paranormal because, well, it makes no sense. We've well, had you know, you, you come up with the uh, logical answers, and when you don't have any more logical answers, then you got to look some, uh, somewhere else. And, and, you know, in our field, there's always a little something, you know, a little tidbit or a little crumb trail or some kind of evidence. Mm -hmm. It may not get you to solve the case, but you kind of get an idea what happened. You know, but this one, there ain't a whole lot. Well, we talk about in, in criminal investigations, there's always evidence. It's a question of whether or not you can find it. You know, everybody, yeah. every crime scene has evidence. But they just yeah. couldn't find any on this one. Except so, for one thing. They did find one thing. Mm -hmm. and that was a so to continue on, Eris was traveling with others when she disappeared. She and her father were with six other people. The group was horseback riding and had reached Sunrise High Sierra Camp before Aris wandered off to take photographs of a nearby lake. So they ride their horses up to this camp, and there's a nearby lake. And uh, the girl, Stacy, decides she's going to take some pictures of the lake. She wanders off to take pictures of the lake, as they say here. I don't really know how far away the lake is just yet. The camp was a tourist destination, meaning there were people around to watch Aris and she walked as she walked towards the lake. Mm -hmm. While the group was resting, Aris told her father she wanted to hike down to take pictures of the nearby lake. Her father declined to join her. When Aris left her companions, the tour guide recalled seeing her standing on a rock about 50 yards south of the trail. The trail to the lake was only 1.5 miles long. Well, they, they say only 1.5 miles. That's actually a pretty good distance in the wilderness. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not like 1.5 miles on a sidewalk. Uh, <clears throat> that is the last time anyone has officially reported seeing Stacy. When Stacy wandered off, a 77-year-old man from her camp group accompanied her. That's always suspicious. The man sat down to rest while Stacy walked ahead. When Stacy didn't return, the man got up to look for her, then gathered the remainder of the group to search more extensively. He later reported that he spoken with a group of hikers, but they said they hadn't seen her. So her and this 77 year old man that's part of the group walk off towards the lake. He's an old dude, so he halfway there stops, sits down while she continues on. And that's the last time he's seen her. And the old man came across some other hikers and asked them if they seen her, Stacy, and they said no. So far correct, right? <laughs> yeah, witnesses say they saw the man sitting down as Stacy wandered off, the man meaning the 77-year-old man, and there is no further evidence implicating him in any wrongdoing. Which is the first thing I thought of when I read the story. I, don't know, yeah. I, I think it's the first thing anybody would think of. Um, yeah. An average person would think, well, he's 77 years old, what's he going to do? I've seen some very, very old people do some very, very bad things. <laughs> 
with the, you know, with people dishing out testosterone and Viagra, the old men are capable of many things. Uh, let's see. When when Stacy wandered off, the seventy-seven year old man from her camp group accompanied her. Well, we already read this. I don't know why they say it twice. Uh, witnesses say they saw the man sitting down. I really read that. So she left behind only one item, despite the search beginning only minutes after Stacy vanished, which is important. I mean, that's really you know usually search and rescue started way afterwards. First a family or friends start looking and then they have to call and then it usually takes forever but they, they all start looking right away um uh, no one found any traces of the 14 year old girl except for the lens from her camera it was found in the lens cap yeah it wasn't a lens it was the lens cap it was found inside the groove of a tree that stacy entered before presumably photographing the lake i don't know what that means it was found inside the groove of a tree so what the way i'm i read it was she took the lens cap off the camera she stuck it in like the y of a tree to so it wouldn't fall to take her pictures and she would take it and put it back on that's how i read it anyway that, that would kind of make sense yeah um, something must have been going bad at that point already because why would she leave her lens cover there unless she just forgot uh, Stacy reportedly had several other items on her person. She was wearing an ankle bracelet. Wow, she must have been from New Mexico. Oh, different kind of ankle bracelet. Impossible stud earrings, as well as carrying binoculars and her camera. None of these items were ever turned up. <laughs> Not these items were ever turned up. So, ankle bracelet, earrings, binoculars, a camera. If she would have been attacked or she had to fight, whether humans or animal, Shit would have been strewn somewhere, you know, especially if it was an animal. There'd be like binoculars mm -hmm. laying here, camera mm -hmm. laying there, parts and pieces of clothing, that kind of stuff. But none of that stuff was ever found. Uh, let's see. One experienced climber noted on a forum that if Stacy had lost her lens cap, it shouldn't necessarily be considered a sign of foul play since the caps are easy to lose. Well, that's kind of what we said. My only, here's my argument with that. She didn't lose it. It was put in the in, into the fold of a tree. To me, that's a deliberate act of putting it somewhere so I, I don't lose it. Yeah. Now, could she have walked off and forgot it? Anything's possible. But Probably. That's the first indication that something, something could be happening. It could be just she forgot it or something startled her and she's already in panic mode and like, you know, screw the cap. Yeah, but think about this. All right, I'm not so much worried about the – If I can I interject? Uh, anytime you want. Okay. I'm not so uptight about not finding the ankle bracelet or obviously the earrings, okay? But binoculars, camera, you're, you're, you're hanging on to those items. If she ran and she was trying to get away from something, that would encumber her. And you'd think she would have, she would have tossed it. You think she would have yelled? I mean, that wasn't that far away from the main camp. No. Um, that wasn't found as if something it had been ripped off of her in that area. That tells me that she traveled traveled herself with those items before something happened from that spot. That's what it says to me. Or just to turn yeah. a paranormal eye to it, she just disappeared from that spot. I, I'm, I'm kind of intrigued, and we don't have all the information. We we don't have the uh, the transcript of any statement taken from the seventy seven year old man. We're assuming this is a mule pack trip, from what I was reading, where they got together and the whole group was going to go out on mules or horses to a campsite. So, okay, they had strangers there, but I find it interesting that after just a few minutes, this guy suddenly got worried and called everybody in. Uh, something's ringing funny to me about that it's you know they've just met maybe they've been traveling for a few hours had had he gotten to know the young lady very well he saw her and just a few minutes later they say he was saying hey where is she we got to find her could it could it be just a you know grandpa lee like 
care because yeah, on put, be. putting the shoe on the other foot what the heck is he going to do and what did he what did he do with the body in that short amount of time you know how would he hurt that girl without anybody else seeing or hearing her and dispose of her and all of her stuff her equipment and nobody ever found it and, and that's an excellent point and along those lines at five foot five 120 pounds him being 77 we don't know what kind of physical shape he was in you would have thought she'd been able to put up some sort of a, a struggle or fight, which once again would have left something, uh, some stuff laying around. Another thing I don't think you mentioned yet that I read that her dad had told her to change her shoes and she said mm -hmm. not to. So she walked down there in flip flops. Right. Yeah, you're not going to run. How far are you going to go in that? How are you going to go into the bush out there with flip flops and get far and not lose them too? Yeah. Yeah. So let me read on here and see what else it says. Stacy's group began searching for the girl not long after she disappeared. I hate when they say that because not long, what does that mean? You yeah. know, hours, minutes, next day. A rescue crew invested extensive efforts to find her. It's all the more bizarre that she has not been found. By some reports, up to 150 people looked for the teen, which included roughly 67 mountain rescue volunteers, dogs, and a helicopter. Uh, all canvassing a three to five square mile area around Sunrise Lake. Despite this, the camera lens is the only clue. That always bugs me because protocol for search and rescue is always like a two or three mile radius. And uh, many, many times the body is found, you know, 15, 20 miles away. That radius should be our, bigger. Our last case. Let's look at our last case. The yeah. Yuba 5, County yeah, 5. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> that radius should be expanded like right away. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> For some reason, these people are, making, are covering great distances really quick. According to news articles from the Fresno Bee in 1981, the dogs employed in the search were unable to pick up any scent because of dry and dusty conditions. On a forum dedicated to discussion about unresolved mysteries, uh, I, don't, I don't even know what the hell it says, Ektro Abaya shared an antidote about how the elements in the wilderness, that is wind, trees, and canyons, can affect a person's sense of hearing. I guess he's talking about why nobody heard any screams or yelling because of the distance, trees, wind, that kind of stuff. Which, no, no I don't buy that. Unless it's like freaking blowing 60 miles an hour out there. She left the group and was wearing, I don't know, she left the group and was exploring alone, off trail, which is very dangerous. If you aren't carrying navigation tools and experienced in using them, she was also likely distracted, paying more attention to photography than to navigation. So they're kind of saying that she may have wandered off in the wrong direction and got lost. The search was fairly small relative to the size of the area they had to work with. And it's likely she kept moving even when she realized she was lost because majority of people do. But it's also the absolute worst thing to do in almost any case because then searches are playing catch up. Look, she's a 14 year old girl wearing flip flops. Uh, how far could she wander off in flip flops? Well, I can throw, throw this out too. This is obviously a guided tour, which means these guides have taken pack horses and other groups through there and they've stopped at the spot before. We're assuming, okay? Which means they've got to know the area pretty well, wouldn't you think? They yes. knew that the, the lake was just down the road. If it's a half, mile and a half away, the guide had to say, lake's just down that way. They probably, unless they were above the lake, couldn't see it. You know, above the lake looking down, maybe. But I, I've, got to, I've got to believe they knew the area since they went through that with other group, tour, tour groups. Yeah, and if the, if the tour guides thought there was some kind of hazard or it was dangerous, they would have certainly you know sounded up about don't let this fourteen year old girl wander off to the lake. You know, mm -hmm. apparently it's something that happens quite often. I mean, you camp here, the lake's right down there. You can see it. Uh, I'm going to go down to the lake, take some pictures. It shouldn't be that big of a deal. If it was dangerous, somebody would have said something like, "No, no, no, you shouldn't let that girl go down there by herself." Mm -hmm. Did you notice, too, that there's very little said about the uh, leader of the group from the mm -hmm. company that was – very little was said about who was in charge of that group. I, I noticed yes. that. Or pretty much everybody that was in the group. You know, you, you, we know about the old man, and we know the dad. But who, mm -hmm. who are the rest of the people? 
And where were they all at? Yeah. Still yeah. does not explain how if you go into a national forest or a national park and your intentions are, or, or you, you just with a group and suddenly you have these ill intentions and you want to kill this little girl and you're not totally familiar with this area, or you may be a little bit familiar with this area. How do you kill a person without making it known to anybody else, you know, the screaming, the yelling, or dispose of everything without ever being found, ever being found? Especially if they were searching within 15, 20 minutes, even an hour. Yeah. They, they should have found something. Now, one thing they didn't mention, there was there a cliff near there? Was there any, were they high up and maybe something could have gone off the side? Not that I didn't. Don't know you if still I think you would have found it. You still think you would have found it. Yeah. Because if we think of that, I'm sure the search and rescue guys thought of that too. Like, oh, yeah. well, she yeah. probably fell off a cliff. She probably fell off a rock. You know, <clears throat> maybe she fell down an old hole, a mine shaft. If there's any mine shafts out there. Um what were there any other what were the interviews like with the other people in the group? Did they notice any sort of I also had read that she was having some family issues. Her, yeah. uh, her her she had a boyfriend and apparently there's some issues there she was missing her boyfriend and there was some inclination or talk about maybe she ran off she would have not f switched into flip-flops to run off that's what i'm thinking i would but agree. We'll, we'll, i think it mentions that in here go ahead, yeah, go ahead i'm sorry go so ahead. a point a point i see brought up fairly often is that she was without she was within shouting distance but i don't think there's a way to prove that Sound in the wilderness is weird. I spent a ton of time hiding from searchers. I don't know who's actually writing this. I spent a ton, ton of time hiding from searchers as a training subject. And even, I'm, and even I'm still sometimes surprised at how variable sound can be. I've had searchers shouting for me from maybe 50 feet away who I couldn't hear because of a slight ridge and wind blowing away from me. Eh. Most search and rescue guys, you know, they blow whistles. Um, I, I don't, I don't buy that. I've spent a lot of time in the woods, and sound travels pretty freaking good, unless it's really windy or you're near a stream or waterfall or something. And you, it's making a lot of noise. But for the most part, you can hear pretty good out there. On the other, on the other hand, I've been freaked out by hearing a dog panting and a human's voice just above me when I knew the team wasn't close to me yet because I was hiding on the edge of a canyon and there was a weird magnifying echo effect usually the trend is for sound to be dampened though even a bit of vegetation a small hill and a slight breeze can uh, noticeably change and muffle the sounds to a surprising degree all of that yeah but if the girl is lost she's going to be listening for people and she's going to be yelling back or she's going to be screaming help or something she's just not going to sit there hunched over waiting for somebody to find her uh, well, once if again, we're not talking days. We're not talking days. Yeah. We're talking minutes. You know, what, probably less than an hour. If she wandered off, let's say she she made it down to the close to the lake and she's wearing her flip flops. She goes off trail to get a better picture. It'd be kind of hard to get lost near a lake anyway, because these are small little mountain lakes. It's not like freaking Lake Erie. I mean, I don't know how you get lost around a lake. I mean, you see where the lake is at, and you just go back to where you came in. But even if she did wander off away from the lake and couldn't see the lake anymore. She couldn't have gone very far in flip-flops. And if she's lost, she would stop every once in a while and listen. And uh, because a short time's only gone by. It's not like she's 20 miles away, hopefully. Mm -hmm. She would have heard something. Well, I, I'm making an, I got to make an assumption here, and we all know what that does when you assume. But she's got binoculars. She's got a camera. Tells me that she's done this before, and she's taken pictures like this before which means she's got some level of experience. Again, the lake is a mile and a half away. The guide's got to say the lake's that way down that trail. He's not going to send her down, you know, a, a, a deer trail or something like that or a, in, in the middle of woods. It's, there's, there's obviously a trail that takes you to the lake a mile and a half away. And didn't they? Didn't the, the guide, the one time they mentioned the guide, saw her off the trail about 50 yards? Mm -hmm. Taking a picture, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so she was prone to like, you know, skip off the trail to take pictures. 
It still doesn't excuse you getting hopelessly lost and never found, though. So it's weird because it says the National Park Service doesn't keep track of disappearances, and they don't, which seems yeah, really bizarre. Yeah. It's like, well, people disappear in the parks all the time. We don't keep track of that. That's law enforcement's job. And, uh, uh, National Park Service has a law enforcement arm. But it may be bad for business, maybe. That's why. Because, you well, know, it's a business. I learned that when I, uh, you know, as a farms instructor, I did several classes for our state parks guys. And state parks have a law enforcement branch who go through a regular police academy. In fact, when I went through the police academy, there were like four state parks guys in there. But their policy and procedure is really, really bizarre. Uh, their sworn police officers basically have authority throughout the state. They're state employees. Mm -hmm. But their policy and procedure is they cannot enforce laws off of state park property. And the issue was like, what if I leave the state park? I'm in my state park's police car. I have a badge and a gun on and I see a drunk driver. Can I act on that? No, you cannot. You can follow and you need to call somebody else, a, a law enforcement agency yeah. to intervene. I'm like, that is some bullshit. So they were, yeah. they, were very like dis they were very disgruntled, the state parks out here. And because of that, because they all felt like they were cops, but not cops. You know, they had the same training, they had to go through the same bullshit in the academy, but didn't get to be real cops. A lot of stuff was always brushed underneath the carpets. A lot of accidental shootings and stuff like that that happened at the parks, never reported. That, that's so. been said about the national parks for years. And, you know, some of the uh, gentlemen that I know, uh, Chris George, used to talk about that. They just cover stuff up and it's bad for business. They don't want people to be afraid to go to the national parks. Well, when you have 5 million people show up at Yosemite every year, can you imagine the amount of money that generates? I mean, I think national parks to get in here, it's like $35 per person or per car load or something. It's, it's pretty pricey to get into a national park. It's not wow. it's not cheap. You multiply that times two, three, four, or five million, there's some big money being made in national parks. So if you hmm. advertise people are disappearing in your parks, and weird policies, no, no uh, commercial drone footage or anything like that. Uh, a lot of areas are completely restricted to drones, whether it's for commercial or private use. Uh, Why? Well, I would, I'd like to know what the reasoning behind that is. I have no idea. But if, if you like, if you have a monetized YouTube channel, mm -hmm. you cannot go into a national park and shoot a video uh, and put it on YouTube because it's monetized and you're basically profiting off of their national park. They act like it's theirs. The national yeah, park should be everybody's. <laughs> Don't our taxes like yep. pay for the upkeep there? They have some strange mm -hmm. rules. The national park. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Ayers is one of many people who disappeared in a national park. Though the exact number is unknown, the National Park Service doesn't keep a record of, of the many people who have vanished in their parks. Uh, let's see. So it, it's unlikely that Stacy ran away because of her shoes. And we haven't really talked about the shoes. According to the news article published in the Fresno Bee around the time of Stacy's disappearance, park officials said Stacy was having some family or school troubles, and she was missing her teenage boyfriend. It is speculated that perhaps the teen ran away or had simply embarked on a walk into the woods. However, National Park spokesman Linda Abbott countered that Stacy would not have gone for a walk since the teen wasn't wearing suitable shoes. The last conversation Stacy had with her father was about her shoes. He thought she should change into her hiking boots, but she walked off in a pair of flip-flops instead. So that kind of eliminates if she was a troubled teen and she missed a boyfriend and she thought, I thought her dad was a dick and I hate going camping with all you people and these horses suck. I'm going to walk back home to my boyfriend. She would have put her hiking shoes back on. <laughs> you don't walk yeah, around in the wilderness and flip-flops. Yeah. And and like I said, I, I'm making an assumption here. She's got some level of understanding. I mean, she's a photographer. She must have been out in the woods before. I'm assuming she must have done something like this prior to this mule packing trip up at, up the mountains in Yosemite National Park. I, those, and, these are the, some of the things that we don't know, unfortunately. And if she was so disgruntled about going and not wanting to be there and rather be with her boyfriend... She would have brought a camera and a binoculars to begin with. She's like, I hate this place. I don't even want to be here. Damn yeah, sure I ain't going to take any pictures of it. <laughs> right? Yeah, good point. Good point. Good point. So let's see. Yosemite is known for its large population of black bears. There are about three to 500 bears in the park alone. As a national park is a popular place to hike, visitors are to remain at least 50 yards from any bear they encounter in undeveloped areas. And... Uh, 
if a black bear would have eaten her, you would have found clothing, plastics, cameras, knockers, well, let, bones. Bears, what, four, three, four hundred pounds? Wouldn't you have heard something going on? Yeah. Crashing through the woods and they're screaming, yelling. And I mean. Yeah. And it's, it's pretty rare for black bears to attack people anyway. I've seen tons of black bears and they're pretty skittish. I mean, it happens every once in a while, but she was kind of a small girl. So maybe, but once again, like you said, you would have heard something and you would have found something blood on the, on the ground. Something. I mean, they don't, they don't, they're not tidy when they eat, you know, and this. I, I yeah. just uh, I just don't think that's a viable answer. No, it's not. I don't think it was predation at all because there was nothing ever found. So the, though these statistics evoke a small probability that Stacy encountered one of these animals on her trip to the lake, it is unlikely that they would have confronted her, considering the National Park Service claim claims no one in Yosemite has perished from an encounter with a black bear. So there you go. And plus, it happened so quick. I mean, the old man is taking a break. He sits down on his rock, and he watches her wander off into the distance and then doesn't, doesn't see her anymore. So at what point did she disappear? And, you know, they, Apparently, and we haven't seen the police reports yet, but um, apparently people saw him sitting there when she wandered off, which if that is accurate as it sounds, that does eliminate him as being a suspect at all. Mm -hmm. So there's little evidence to suggest that a person is responsible for Stacy's disappearance, but some still speculate that this may be the case. Moreover, investigators have not ruled out the possibility of something nefarious. Um, mm. Possibly. I mean, I, I wouldn't rule it out completely. I mean, if you take a person at gunpoint or muffle them or, or you know, make them stay quiet or knock them out, I guess you could get drug off, but still. They were a long yeah, ways. They I mean, rode. They rode their horses out there to where they're at. It's not like they were next to a highway and they could have thrown in a car and and driven off. Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. Well, still kind of still kind of strange. I mean, there is talk, and I don't know if we want to bring up the yeti in the room, so to speak. But, yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> the yeti. <laughs> could it have been a um, something we can't explain? Could it have been some sort of event, as we've discussed in past shows? Well, I would definitely chalk it up as a, as a very likely because nothing was found. Uh, any kind of fight with a human would have left some kind of trace evidence. Any fight with an animal would have left some kind of trace evidence. But she just simply vanished. I mean, it's not, it's not just somebody's word. It's a whole search and rescue team out there looking for shit. And nothing is found. And it's been since 1980, whatever the heck it was, 81. And nothing has, there's been a million hikers out there in that area already since. And, mm -hmm. you know, people, sometimes when people are lost a year or two years later, you know, somebody finds something. Nothing's been found. Yeah. And, I, and once again, they, they had the, the cops were out there. They, they searched the area. Maybe they didn't search it, open up the uh, uh, parameter, perimeter rather as far as they could have. But you know what I did find, did notice also? Go back to our last show about the Yuba, Yuba County Five. People were complaining. They didn't do enough. They didn't do enough. Excuse me. I didn't see that in the news articles here. I didn't hear the family screaming that law enforcement didn't do enough. It sounds like they did everything they could right off the bat. Yeah. I, I, I know the, and I've mentioned this before, I'm kind of beating a dead horse, but um, the older gentleman so quickly thinking something was wrong. I don't know. There's just something about that that strikes me funny, and I, I can't put my finger on it. I'm 50-50 on that. I mean, it depends what the area looks like. You know, if it's kind of flat, it would be fairly flat if there's a lake nearby, since lakes are flat. Uh, if if you're an old guy sitting on a rock, you get to know this girl, and in 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 the in most innocent of, of ways, yeah, uh, right. And you you watch her walk off, and you look away, and you know you're kind of old. You take a take a couple of deep breaths, and like, oh, this really sucks. My back hurts, and you look up, and like, where the hell did she go? I just seen her over there at the edge of the water a second ago. And you know, where is she? 
I could see that being concerning. And uh, you know, your first thought would be she found the lake and drowned. That's what I would think. But they, they weren't near the lake. Right. She never got to. They weren't near the lake at that point. He was right. just. It was just down the down the walk a little bit. And and you're probably right. I guess. Uh, it, uh, we don't know how close they were. Had they become friendly on the ride out? Uh, did they spend any time talking before the the trip began? Did the did, did dad and her become friends? Did the dad say to her, "Hey, can you keep an eye on her if you're walking that way?" We don't know those things. So, but the, the biggest crux in that whole thing for me is, let's say the old guy did have bad intentions, and they're not that far. The lake's only a mile and a half away, and they're not even there yet. They're just a little ways from camp. And suddenly the old man snaps and he goes, I'm going to rape and kill this girl. And nobody heard anything. And what did he do with her? Once again, no evidence in the area. Look, right. he could be a great in great shape for 77, but you still have physical limitations at 77. Well, you even, know, if you were, if, even if you were 30 years old, what yeah, are you I, going to do with the body that's so that yeah. nobody can find it forever? <laughs> what are you doing? I, I I agree. I agree. I just the, if you would have covered her up with rocks, you know, if you if you would have like drug her off and covered her up with rocks, the dogs would have found, found her. Yeah, the dogs would have yeah. found that. Yeah. Uh, plus, he wasn't gone all that long. That would all take time. If he killed mm -hmm. that girl and drug her somewhere, and he's trying to hide her, you know, the hours would go by. And then the question would be like, where the hell were you? And now you're saying my daughter's missing, and. Uh, Mm -hmm. Where were you between these all this time? I mean, what, what happened here? I'm just, I'm going to look something up here, then I'll bring it up to you. This just hit me now. Uh, and I'm not going to say anything yet. Let me just look at something here. Why are you doing that? I'll read the next last line. Yeah, here. Go ahead. I'm, I'm just says, is it at all possible and or likely that she did get lost and wandered around for a while, unable, unable to hear anyone call her or she was too far away to be heard? But someone who knows the park better than her approached her to help, but is actually a deranged person or something along those lines. And we kind of mentioned that in Yuba 5, and we mentioned that definitely in the one before that. Uh, with, with the guy Always that died, something to think about. Died in his hammock. You know, I, I'm convinced there's there are feral people that live out in some of these big national parks. You know, they have completely withdrawn from society and are just mentally ill. Totally and is it possible that she got lost so bad or wandered off far enough away where this guy pops out of the woodwork and says, "Hey, are you lost?" Could the guy? Could somebody have been stalking the group, looking for an opportunity? But, could it be? Go ahead. Still not found, even if it was a deranged guy out in the park and near the lake or before you get to the lake, you'd think you would have found something. Because once again, she's a 14-year-old girl. She wouldn't just willingly, you know, she would, she would put up a fight, uh, presumably. She wouldn't just randomly go with some guy that's been living in the forest that looks pretty raggedy and, and yeah. just follow him around. I mean, surely she'd be smarter than that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, go, looking at back at some of the uh, – uh, stuff uh, stuff uh, from the reports the the uh, parks people encouraged folks to come out and help them they contacted some folks that were involved in in rescue per professional uh, rescue mountain rescue workers they they reached out to them they had helicopters up 100 150 people out there all within hours hard hard to uh, really criticize their response it looked like it was it was spot on it was quick maybe they didn't make it wide enough but you know if you're thinking if they're if they're literally looking within an hour how far could she go in flip-flops off trail less than a mile less than a mile yeah. the average walking speed on flat terrain is three miles an hour mm -hmm. you know in flip-flops and mountainous terrain you're not covering any three miles an hour <laughs> not even close not even close. And, you know, another thing is she never reappeared. Like if she was a runaway or, you know, she, she got away from somebody or she never resurfaced anywhere in the country or anywhere in this world mm -hmm. saying this is what happened. She's just gone. So mm -hmm. you know, it's a pretty safe bet to say she's not alive. Yeah, at this point especially. I was just looking, what I was looking up here, 
was any, uh, you know, any unusual UFO activity in yeah. Yosemite. And it, it, you know, there, there's some of course, but it's, it's not any more than other spots from what little I could see there. So I, I don't know. Um, I'm going to bring up this word too. This is going to make some of our listeners crazy dimensions. Did she somehow slip into something? There are reports of uh, at Yosemite where people have hiked and seen a shimmering like portal in the trail mm -hmm. and turned around and came the other way. And <laughs> they went back. They're like, okay. It, it was usually accompanied by an eerie feeling, almost like me at the casino. An eerie feeling, all noises stopped. You know, birds singing, the wind blowing, everything stopped. It got deadly quiet. And they'd see mm -hmm. the shimmery thing in the trail. And they would, common sense would kick in and they'd say, okay, I've gone far enough and turn around and come back. Had they not turned around, it'd probably be another missing person. You know, another missing person report, like, where the hell did they mm -hmm. go? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's quite a few of those cases at Yosemite that I've read about. And, you know, like some of our past cases, we have a third and fourth party that had some sort of suspicious connection to the whole thing that we could even look at and say, could that be the one, i.e., the uh, guy in the little VW uh, with the Yuba County 5? His whole story never made sense to me. They don't have that in this case. You've no. got the 77-year-old man, who we don't know his name, but he's, there are witnesses that apparently have been interviewed and all said he was sitting there when she walked off. Yeah. It, it would all be much easier to explain if they hadn't rode horses and mules off into the middle of nowhere. If they were closer to the entrance of the park or the park's edges okay. or this highways. Because there's, there's another big case that happened there to a uh, mom and daughter that were staying in a motel just outside the park entrance. And they were abducted. Or there was two, a mom, daughter, and a daughter's friend. And all three of them eventually found dead. Uh, brutally killed, uh, burnt in a car, locked in a trunk in a car, set on fire. And uh, the third girl was found in a stream decapitated. And uh, that one was solved. And it was actually an employee at the motel, uh, a younger gentleman who... Uh, it's a crazy story and a crazy history on this, but he, he also, uh, the, the guy that worked at the hotel, his brother was abducted by a, um, a pedophile and his brother managed to escape years later. And his brother got all the limelight, you know, how he survived and all that stuff. And the older brother felt left out from that point on. And then like he wanted to limelight too. And he became a virtually a serial killer. But this happened right at, outside of Yosemite. I mean, virtually right on the border of the park. So there's tons of stuff like that. But this guy, you know, is close to town. He's an employee there. Uh, it was easy, fairly easy to solve. Mm -hmm. This girl's out in the middle of nowhere. So it, it, it's like I said, she's not near a highway. It's not like somebody grabbed her and threw her in a car and they drove off. Her body presumably is still out there somewhere. You know what I, <laughs> I'd love to know is if during their search, they found any indications of any other human in the area, small campsite, uh, a place where somebody stopped to eat, a place where somebody may have been sitting and watching. You know, was there any any indication there was another human being out there? The, the old man says he, he'd seen a couple hiking, right? And he said... That's true, he did. You're right. Have you seen the girl? And they said no. But who are they? Yeah. The, the, yeah. Who, you know... But once again, you know, that's, that's easy, but also impossible because... Let's say those two hikers are the ones that killed the girl. Well, what the heck did they do with her? Nobody heard anything, seen anything, because not that much time has gone by. So you just randomly come across a girl and kill her, and then what? Yeah, I think I think that's the crux of your, your whole argument, which I have to agree with. There's no evidence of anything happening, no evidence of a fight, no evidence of anything traumatic, no blood, no things. Her, her camera and her binoculars just disappeared now you, you mentioned something earlier about sometimes you can't always hear things well sometimes you can't always see things too you'll walk by something a hundred times yeah, yeah. and you, nobody notices it i suppose that's it within the realm of possibility but when you've got that many people over 150 searching for there's if and it seems like they were doing it right you've got people overlaying what the next last person did. So you've got a couple people going over the same area. Did everybody miss it? Yeah. And my second thought was, my first thought was the old man at first. And then I'm thinking, I kind of ruled him out. And then the second thing I thought of is, 
she probably drowned and she fell in the lake but they searched the lake from what the stories i've read it's not in this article specifically but some of the other ones i read they did search the lake and had dive teams out there and um, they, they don't think she ever made it to the lake and uh, most of the oh, i agree so. i absolutely agree she didn't make it to the lake yeah. i don't think she was even heading that direction because she went off to the side to take the pictures the 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 guide the only mention of him in there saw her on a rock 50 yards away or so from from the campsite mm -hmm. and based upon what we were reading that's where they found the the lens camera or the yeah. camera lens cover rather so i don't think she went to the lake i think she was i think she disappeared disappeared from the area where they found the lens cap and if if she accidentally found the lake and drowned let's say she actually made it there she would have resurfaced eventually once the body starts decomposing and bloating, she'd have popped up, and mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. thousands of other campers that have gone through there would have found something by now. And you know, nothing, nothing's been yeah. found. Yeah. In uh, modern modern clothing, you know, nylons and polyesters and stuff, they don't. Uh, the weather doesn't uh, tear that stuff down. Fifty years mm -hmm. later, you can still find stuff laying out there. You know, it mm -hmm. doesn't doesn't this doesn't go away. And we have to take it under. Under the belief that these people knew the lake, they knew the conditions of the lake, they knew the if there was any drift in the lake or any current of any kind that would have moved anything from that spot. Uh, because it seems like they did an efficient job of checking everything. Uh, the only issue we got is the perimeter. Maybe could have been larger. Mm -hmm. but, we, but, but I'm not 100% sure what the terrain was like. I'll uh, add some pictures to the end of this video. I'll pull up some Google map pictures and put it on the end of this video because i did look at it uh, not through google maps but some of the pictures they had on these articles and the lake it's a typical mountain lake which isn't very big nor mm -hmm. deep you know they call them mountain lakes but they're, they're more you in florida would call it a pond you okay. know they're, they're not very big but I'll, I'll add some pictures to that to see uh, all in all it's a hell of a mystery i mean i don't know how else to explain it except for you know interject some of the paranormal stuff i mean could it could a bipedal eight foot tall hairy beast just have grabbed her and ran off at a high rate of speed and be 15 miles away in less than an hour well that's that is a suggestion of some but i still have to question why wasn't something heard why wasn't there some evidence of a struggle something that big coming through the bushes to get this kid would have had to break some branches or do something. Um, text her up, runs off with her, the camera or the binoculars are going to fly off of her. Flip-flops are going to come off. You know how flip-flops are. Yeah, yeah, something right. would have come. So That's actually a biggest part of the mysteries is the flip-flops. You know, For one, she wore flip-flops, so that kind of rules out anything else she had intended and the second thing is they were never found and you're right flip-flops don't stay on your feet if you're being picked up drug around anything uh, your flip-flops gonna pop off and unless the killer was so thorough you know like oh pick up the flip-flops and then what no. <laughs> then, then do what no. with the body he's, yeah I, I, and you got a, you got somebody that's probably fighting unless he's somehow rendered the person unconscious at that point but we're still talking yards we're not yeah. talking five miles. At and it's this hard. Point. It's hard to hide things in the forest. It sounds easy. We used to play paintball in the forest all the time, and it's harder than you think to hide yourself in the forest. You know, you stick out like a sore thumb unless you look like a tree mm -hmm. or a rock. Um, <laughs> it's it's pretty pretty hard to, if you were to kill somebody in the forest just to make you disappear to where 150 people and dogs and helicopters can't see you. And You're what? One thing I'd also like to know is was infrared used? Yeah, on the helicopter. That was nineteen eighty one, eighty two. I don't know if they, they really were used had. To, they had flare they back then. Yeah. Um. I now I don't know that it was as widespread as it is now, but they had flare. Um. Of course, if she was uh, dead, the flare wouldn't probably help you much. Well, it would for a while. The first I mean, hour. Again, <laughs> yeah, but we're, once again, we're not. Yeah, it probably would. Let, Took longer than an hour to get a helicopter up there, so you got a point there. So, but the dogs, dogs are usually pretty successful, and uh, even you know, even later on, cadaver dogs and that kind of stuff, and nothing has ever been found. That's the biggest problem. Yeah, it makes no I sense. Agree. So, 
could it have been a hairy critter? Could it have been a portal? You know, ultimate dimension. And it's like I've said on one of our episodes, you know, is, is, is the reason the National Park Service is so extreme about letting civilians run amok in these parks because they're actually hiding something in there? Because maybe they are aware, and maybe not the park ranger, but the upper echelon of this outfit. Maybe these parks were established to protect some entity that's running amok out there, you know? Oh, we're getting deep in the conspiracy world there. That's an interesting concept, though. Well, there's a reason they're so protective of these parks, which are supposed to be our parks. You know, why can't you fly a drone in a national park? Are they afraid you might see something? I mean, who are you hurting? Yeah, uh, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I assume there's got to be some some permit you could get to fly a, a, a drone under in there under certain conditions. There is, and it's, it's, a, it's a lengthy process, and their decision is final. Uh, there's no like, you know, fill out a permit, pay twenty bucks, and you can fly a drone. It's like no, they they want to know what you're doing, how long you're going to do it for, where are you going to be, what area you're going to be film filming, and then they make a decision, and it's final. They say, yeah, okay, you're good to go, or negative, you're not going to do it. And it's completely up to them. They're like their own little freaking country in there. It's really bizarre. It does. It does kind of. Sp- spike in, in in a bit of intrigue in me as to why 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 is that the case i mean if we own it if it's a if, if our taxpayer money is paying to upkeep the park and to keep it safe and uh and i hate to say this being a cop because i hate it when people used to say i pay your salary but i mean we do our tax money does keep the parks going our fees to get in there keeps the parks going it was tuddy roosevelt designed it for the people to enjoy the splendors of our country why can't we look at it from a drone yeah and you know there's also a high number of uh rangers park state park or federal park rangers that have gone missing also never to be found oh yeah that's a whole different episode in and of itself yeah and and those guys get trained in search and rescue and surviving in the wilderness Mm -hmm. and they know their parks they know their parks inside out yeah and quite a few we could probably do an episode on that on how many park rangers have disappeared and never to be found yeah we're gonna have to we're gonna have to do that and then i'm anxious to see uh not to give anybody a hint, but what you've got for next show also kind of has me intrigued. Yeah, that one's going to be different too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's going to be very, very different. So what in the world is causing all this? I don't know. But in conclusion on Miss Stacy Harris, uh, you know, I usually come up with some kind of hypotheses or some kind of idea, but on this one, I'm truly drawing a blank unless there's more information out there that I couldn't find. I would love to see some police reports and I would love to see who else was in the group, but all of that is good and dandy. It still doesn't explain how you dispose of a body to where it can yeah. never be found. You yeah, know, unless I mean, you're the mafia out there and you have some kind of acid bath <laughs> and then you would find chemicals out there. Yeah. So what happened? I would love to read the reports to see what the other members of the group had to say about the family dynamics, what they saw about the little girl, maybe her act, her actions with her dad, how she interacted with her dad, what her attitude was. I would love to read all that, but I, your point is well taken. It's not like she wandered 10 miles. It's not like she was gone 10 hours. You know, she was right there in an area where this group has obviously gone before. And this guide appears, I mean, for, or at least the group this guide worked for goes through that spot all the time because they had a, an established camp, Camp Sunshine or something mm-hmm, like that. Mm-hmm. They had an established camp that they take the mules to. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if she had intentions of running away, disappearing, then she wouldn't have gone with an old man halfway to begin with. You know, she, uh, she would have just like walked off in a different direction. Like, I don't need no chaperone. I don't need nobody watching me. I'm 14 years old. Leave me alone. But it seems like she willingly, you know, just walking along with this old guy. And the old guy takes a break and she disappears. So, I don't know. So, this one's a true mystery. And I don't think it'll ever be solved. It's been too long already. And, uh, well, you never know. They could conceivably find something somewhere. If they haven't by now, I don't know when they would. And take this back, to, or look at this too. I doubt that they stopped using that trail to go from their their headquarters to their camp with the mule. I, I'm sure there's been more 
groups that have gone through there and have walked down to the water or gone down to the water when they stopped. It's the most visited state or federal park, national park in the country. Literally millions of people every freaking year go there. So I'm saying it's impossible if, if she's out there, somebody would have found something. It happens all the time here in New Mexico. We have, we have a woman missing right now up in the Hamas Mountains. She lit, disappeared, I think, October, September last year. Mm -hmm. She still hasn't been found, but that's because there's still like three, four, five feet of snow up there. But you can mm -hmm. bet your butt sometime this summer, some hiker is going to be out there hiking around like, oh, shit, just found a skull. That's what I found. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got to agree with you. This one has me stumped also. So anyway, if you have any ideas or any suggestions about this one, you know, put them in the comments of this video and we'll see. Nothing else about this one for me. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing blank here also. <laughs> well, thank you guys for listening and uh, supporting us. Uh, we'll have a good episode next, next week again. We kind of missed oh, yeah. a week in between because I was on vacation. Hello. But uh, we'll keep knocking them out. And, uh, yeah, and uh, look next time. I think you enjoy this, this show next week. Should be a good one, hopefully. Well, I think so. We'll, we'll see. Anything else? Anything else yeah, before we close it? Nope, and just uh, keep watching, support us. Thanks for being here. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. See you later. Bye. Bye.